Hey everyone, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. I feel like I've been gone for a while. I moved and then I was on a bike vacation in France where I biked around. If you want to follow my bike adventures, I have an Instagram now at Kyla Bikes. There's no post, but I plan to post there. So if you want to follow bikes, go there. But today I'm going to talk about strikes. So if you've been following the writer's strike, the actor's strike, the auto worker's strike, you've noticed that there has been a big movement in labor. Workers have started to stand up and say, hey, listen, we don't like what's going on. Companies have been making mass profits. Hypothetically, there's always pushback against that. But workers are feeling like they're not getting an equal part of that pie. So in this video, I want to talk about the history of strikes, the strikes that we're seeing now, and how we can rethink unions for the future, considering the direction that we need the labor market to go. The pa this has been like a pretty unprecedented time for union work. So recently strikes have resulted in 4.1 million missed days of work, which is the largest since August 2000. We've really seen people sit back and say, listen, things need to be different and we're going to make sure that it's different. But the labor market movement was a huge part of the early, early 19th and 20th centuries in the United States. In, in the late 19th century, this was a time of rapid industrialization, which you could draw some parallels to the AI that we're seeing now, horrendous working conditions, and basically no workers' rights. One of the examples of no workers' rights was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, where doors were locked, a fire was caught, and these workers died inside that factory, resulting in 146 garment workers dying. There was also the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, which was led by wage cuts, really bad working conditions, and everyone was revolting, and the government had to intervene but this was really the you know the 1800s late 1800s early 1900s was a time where workers were finally standing up against the employers and saying things need to be different this was also a time of really bad working conditions people were working in factories there wasn't any safety measures like we have now but this is when we saw things really begin to take off the Wagner Act of 1935 was a big pivotal movement granting workers the right to unionize and bargain collectively the the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, protecting against retaliation for organizing workers. But of course, we can talk about, you know, the effectiveness of that. But there was all these laws that were being passed, these acts are being passed that were meant to protect workers in the 1930s. So all through the 1900s, we saw workers push back against employers saying, hey, listen, things need to be different. Things need to be different. We need to be protected. Employers, of course, hated this and they pushed back against this quite a bit. They did not like collective organizing. Unions scare employers because it can work. If people strike, it works. We're seeing this with the writers. We're seeing this with the auto workers. And part of the reason that we have a 40 hour work week is because of a strike. When Ronald Reagan became president, he was very, very much anti-worker, anti-union. In 1981, he ended the strike for air traffic controllers and then helped support some legislation that made it more difficult for workers to organize. Then there's court rulings and legislation that enabled the permanent replacement of striking workers, stripping unions of key protest tactics, and then defunding them through right to work laws that ban mandatory fees. So basically, if you work for an organization that does have a union attached to it, you don't, you're not forced to pay that fee, you're not forced to join that union, which sounds good and fair, but it also can create uh, misaligned incentives because the workers can benefit from joining a union, but these right to work laws essentially make it so unions can't be established there because they can't afford to be there. There's also aggressive anti-organizing campaigns. And so all of this happened in the back half of the 1900s. And now in the 2000s, we've seen the economy begin to react to this. So US worker productivity and their median pay used to rise together. People used to be paid pretty much how productive that they were. Compensation in a lot of industries has basically stagnated while the cost of housing, healthcare, education has skyrocketed. The federal minimum wage is at 725 and it's been there since 2009. And of course the cost of living has skyrocketed since then. And so workers are sitting back and saying, well, we're really not get, getting paid enough. We're really not 
seeing the matches in productivity that we're producing and this is pretty pretty irritating employers are like well listen you should just be grateful to have a job and like i said these rulings and legislation are in place that provide employers the opportunity to push back against workers who might push back against the pay that they're getting or the situation that they're in i mentioned earlier this National Labor Relations Act, and this is enforced by the National Labor Relations Board. And if an employer goes up against an employee and doesn't pay them enough, which arguably is a lot of industries, the worst thing that can happen is that the employer has to do back pay. They have to reinstate a fired worker. They have to promise to change their behavior. There isn't really any big punishing act that can happen from treating an employee not very well. And also in the United States, it's so easy to fire somebody. In Europe, you have to have like a whole letter. You have to be like, this is all the things that they did bad and we gave them X many chances. In the US, you can just be let go at any moment and not even have a conversation about it. And so the National Labor Relations Act is meant to protect against retaliation for organizing workers, but the threshold for firing is so low in the United States and the National Labor Relations Board doesn't really do that much that none of it really matters and employers can get away with some stuff. Because the National Labor Relations Board doesn't really do that much, firing employees who try to do a union as we saw at Amazon, as we saw at Starbucks, etc. is one of the most effective short-term investments a company can make. You, and so it's legislation and it's court rulings, it's uh, different acts that are not being maybe enforced correctly that has created this labor market storm that we currently exist in. Employees lose an estimated $15 billion a year because companies simply don't pay them the minimum wage that they're owed. Wage theft is the value, um, wage th theft is like the largest amount of property crime um, that we experience. It's people not getting paid what they deserve to be paid, not even deserve to be paid, but what they were promised to be paid is massive it's it's the it rivals the total value of property crime that the FBI tracks. And there's a lot of workplace laws that don't even encompass a lot of workers. The NLRA's organizing rights exclude farm and domestic workers, and then they also exclude disabled workers, tipped workers, prisoners, movie theater attendees, teenagers, supervisors, including un university professors and nurses, because if you're considered a supervisor, you are not part of this NLRA's organizing rights movement. Independent contractors, where a lot of people have said, okay, you're an independent contractor if you're a, co a shovel driver, a cook, a teacher, a mis mixed martial artist, video game developers. If you're a contractor, you really don't have workers' rights. If you're a supervisor, you really don't have workers' rights. If you are a prisoner, a tipped worker, a disabled worker, you really don't have workers' rights. There's a lot to be said about the state of labor law in the United States. And two key examples of this right now are are what the writers are doing and the actors are doing, as well as the auto workers. So the WGA, the Writers Guild Association, has been on strike for 146 days. They came to a preliminary agreement with Hollywood and basically they were like, listen, we want increased pay, we want better residuals because streaming is stressing us out, we want staffing requirements, we want short exclusivity deals and assurance on AI. They also want talk show and game show writers to have a little bit of contractual protection um, because they don't really have any. And so the WGA in Hollywood has come to some sort of agreement. Of course, the 11,000 union members and the um, board of WGA East and West still have to agree on it. The actors are still on strike, but there's some sort of labor solution that seems to be happening here. Some people pointed to the expedited action that happened over the weekend as the California state legislature was passing a bill that guaranteed unemployment insurance for striking workers. And of course, you know, once that's on the table, once there's this foundation for workers who are striking to have some sort of pay, the studios were like, okay, listen, we probably have to respond and figure this out. The bill passed with a 27-12 vote, but only New York and New Jersey have unemployment benefits to workers on strike. Most other states do not. A lot of states, 27 in fact, have right to work laws, so you can sort of evade the unions, especially in the South. 
But it was still a hot union summer, and I'll talk about the auto workers in a second. But more than 650,000 workers were threatening to go on strike this summer, which is the biggest union activity that we've seen in decades, like since the late 1900s, the biggest movement since the 1970s. The share of U.S. private sector that's unionized has fallen from one quarter half a century ago to about 10% today. It's the lowest union um, ship rate in, in ever, actually. So not a lot of people are in unions for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. It's very much disincentivized to join a union. A lot of workers are nervous about going on strike, but we're seeing people do it. We're seeing the workday stoppages rise. We're seeing, um, you know, the Teamsters almost went on strike. The auto workers almost went on strike. UPS. And part of the reason that people feel emboldened to go on strike is because the labor market is tight. And so for the first time in a long time, it's not like there's a line out the door of people who are willing and able to take this job. The employers actually have to sit down and negotiate because the labor market's tight. It's a hot labor market. And also, you know, we, see, we saw a lot of essential workers take on risks during the pandemic and they're like, this sucks a lot. We we see a lot of companies, you know, generating soaring corporate profits, as well as worries about what AI means and wanting some protection around AI. We saw the UPS almost go on strike, but that was negotiated away because the pay increased. Hotel workers were on strike during the Taylor Swift tour to be like, hey, listen, we also need to be paid a little bit more. The railroads were almost going on strike this time last year that because they weren't getting sick leave, like they were not getting time off because they were sick. And so they were like, we're going to go on strike like you're not taking care of us as employees and it's international too so chevron and labor unions uh, reached an agreement to end strikes at lng export plants in australia finland is about to go on strikes because of pay cuts um, and then coal miners have been on strike in Alabama for a while. The NHS, so the National Health Service in London, a lot of their doctors are going on strike. So we're seeing organized labor really begin to stand up and be like, listen, we need to have a conversation, as I've been saying, about what labor looks like and what fair pay looks like and what is fair and equitable in a system that is not designed to necessarily be fair and equitable. And also in the United States, it's one of the few countries where it's banned to carry out solidarity strikes. So if the auto workers are striking, then uh, maybe like other industries that are tangential to that could strike as well. Be like, we got gotcha. you, like we're in it together. But in the United States, that's not allowed. Um, <laughs> and uh, the United States is interesting from a labor market perspective, but going deeper into the auto workers, right? So over the past 30 years, there's been 60 work stoppages under the United Auto Workers Association, including a thousand workers or more. It's more than just auto manufacturing, but this threat that they're doing now is really big because they're going after all three automakers, General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis, which is Fiat Chrysler, at all the same time. So Sean Fain is like this powerhouse union president he was one of the first that was voted in. The other union presidents were really bad. They were like spending money on luxury vacations and, and just not listening to what they were supposed to be doing for the workers that they were meant to be representing. But because Fain was elected in, he's like, okay, listen, I'm going to do things a little bit differently here. So nearly 13,000 workers began striking at three plants on September 15th. And he said, listen, we're going to expand these strikes to 38 General Motors and Stellantis parts distribution centers across 20 states. Ford has been the most responsive to the negotiation, so they're like, we're not going to go after Ford for right now. Um, but the union did expand their strikes across uh, these these uh, 38 plants. Um, and the strike is not economically that impactful. It would only shave off about 0.05% and 0.1 percentage points from annualized economic growth. But it's still something that people are paying attention to, especially because President Biden is expected to walk the picket line. And these auto workers are mostly saying, hey, listen, we want increased pay and we want a shorter work week. They're asking for 32 hour uh, work week and 40% increase in pay. But it's more about the profit sharing. So a lot of these CEO pay um, has skyrocketed. Mary Barra, the GM CEO, went on a show and was like, you know, 95% of my compensation had, comes from the profits that this company generates. And so if you're a worker and you hear your employer or you're the CEO of your company you say like, I'm making a bunch of money because we're making a bunch of money. It's kind of like, but where's my money, right? And so uh, even like, I'm, I'm going to pause here because um, I'm going to continue talking about all this stuff, but just as a tangential you know, it's funny because uh, 
I do stocks, right? Like I, I know how the stock market works and how labor markets work and how it's good for people to be paid less for stocks, right? And at least in the short term. There is a lot of value that comes in the long term from paying people more money and I'll talk all about that and more. But I just wanted to call that out because I know some people are probably already thinking it and I do have a section in the video on it. But just wanted to say it up front because I think that's a little silly for people to be like, just pay people less, the stock will go up. Because that works in the short term, maybe, but definitely not for the long term. So the United Auto Workers are still having ongoing negotiations. They're still trying to figure out what's going on. The worry is, you know, that workers are going to sacrifice and they're not going to reach the conclusion that they want, deterring people from joining unions. But hopefully they get what they're looking for, especially considering that President Biden will be a part of it, essentially, as a pro-union president. So I got this comment that I just mentioned uh, on a recent video, unions inhibit innovation and economic growth because they prevent free market principles such as competition. Imagine a world where AI could write a script 10x more interesting than any Hollywood writer. Why would we want to prevent such a thing uh, when it will clearly benefit the majority of society at the expense of a small few? It's illogical. And of course I could tear apart this comment and point out uh, the parts of the comment that are relatively illogical, one could say, uh, particularly the part of a small few, because I guarantee you if one person's job is impacted by AI in the way that you are describing, your job will probably be impacted by AI and you will be a little bit sad. But unions inhibit innovation and economic growth because they prevent the free market principles such as competition. Unions actually enable a higher level of competition because they enable workers to have a seat at the bargaining table. The free market principles that are being described here is this idea that the market is always right, that the market is always going to come to the conclusion that it needs to. As we've seen, that doesn't always work out like, it, like it's supposed to because incentives, right? So big companies have big CEOs who take a lot of pay, and that distorts market principles that you seem to be describing here. There's a lot of research papers that I'll link in the description box that talk about this a little bit more in terms of how unions can lead to economic growth, partially because they lead to workers feeling more secure. We have to think about society not as you versus the world, but you and the world together. And I think that's just an important thing to consider when we talk about workers' rights, when we talk about labor unions, and when we talk about AI impacting those two things together. So is anyone changing anything? In the United States, there's a lot of labor law reform. Um, Democrats, you know, retook the White House, but Joe Biden um, passed a bill trying to end right-to-work laws and all of this other stuff that is relatively anti-union, expanding the definition of an employee to benefit more people, and then also going after the people who tend to make costly mistakes. In terms of how we make it better, there's a lot of ways that we can reboot labor law, ending at-will employment, um, a sectoral bargaining process similar to Europe, uh, basically address the flaws that are baked into the National Labor Relations Act, because as long as collective bargaining rights, this is written in Bloomberg, are limited to the individual companies where workers have won a unionization election, executives have an overwhelming incentive to fight like hell to stop that from happening. And they have cause to fear they'll be outcompeted by lower cost rivals if they don't. So it's really about expanding union action and making sure that those who need access to workplace support have it. The final thing that I want to talk about is um, this countertop article that was in the LA Times. So these workers who are cutting quartz countertops are getting silica in their lungs and it's cutting up their lungs and it's killing them. And these are workers that are not represented by a union for a variety of reasons, but they are workers who are being essentially killed by their jobs. And so we can celebrate the writers you know, reaching a deal to get more pay. We can celebrate the auto workers reaching a deal to get more pay, but we have to remember that there are workers who are literally dying who need representation from unions or some sort of support. So a video I made yesterday, you know, I was like kind of arguing that unions could be social safety nets. Like how do we make sure that the United States, which does not, does not provide a social safety net, um, could provide one. And maybe that's through unions or through workplace support. But basically the thing is, is we have to remember that unions are good Good. A lot of people support unions, support is at all time high. Nobody's really joining them because of the reasons that I talked about throughout the video. Um, and I think now, so more than ever, we're going to see more people joining them. But we have to remember those that uh, don't have a voice. And how do we make sure that the workplace and the workforce and labor laws 
National Labor Relations Act, hello, is more representative of the people that it needs to be representing because they are dying without this support. So thanks so much for listening. I have my notes attached in the description box below if you want to go check that out. Hope you all are doing okay, and I'll talk to you very, very soon. Bye.